Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We are excited that you could join us today for On Reclaiming Mental Health for Asian Americans. My name is Alex Elliott, and I'm the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university located in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those who were forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramaytush Ohlone lands. If you're interested in learning more about Native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now let me first introduce our presenters, Jenny and Lonnie, and then we will get right to their conversation. Lonnie Chow has been the Director of Clinical Training for the Psychology Doctoral Program at CIIS since 2014. She has been the Director of the Psychological Services Center since 2008. Her research interests are clinical training and supervision, the intersection of psychoanalysis and community mental health, psychodynamic theory and practice, relational theory and intersubjectivity, gender and sexuality, feminist theory, culture and community, and trauma and recovery. Jenny Wang is a Taiwanese American clinical psychologist and national speaker on Asian American mental health and racial trauma in Asian American, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and immigrant communities. Her work focuses on the intersection of Asian American identity, mental health, and social justice. She's the founder of the Asians for Mental Health Instagram community, in which she discusses the unique experiences of Asian diaspora and immigrant communities. She spearheaded the Asian Pacific Islander and South Asian American Therapist Directory and its companion Canadian Directory to help Asians seek culturally reverent mental health providers. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Lani and Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Lonnie. How are you? I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good, good. I'm really, really excited to have this conversation with you. I had the opportunity to read your book. I found it really interesting, both in content and in approach. Mm -hmm. And I was wanting to just launch in, but first, um, you and I had spoken about positioning ourselves, like identifying ourselves for those who are listening so that they have a context of, of who we are a little bit and so that we can deepen our introduction to one another as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I was saying to you that my family is originally from the south southern part of China, mainland China, mm -hmm. um, going back four generations on one side and three on the other mm -hmm. and landed in Hawaii um, and I am at the, actually the generation raised on the mainland, but have moved back to the islands as well with some of my cousins and siblings. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I'm located. How about you? Yeah, so um, my family actually is from a southern part of China originally, but long time ago because they moved to Taiwan um, many, many generations ago, almost so far back. I don't even know how long ago they made that migration. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my family, basically, my parents are the only sibling, siblings who left Taiwan when mm. they immigrated. I was two years old at the time. So I kind of say I'm maybe 1.5 generation because I came <laughs> here when I was two. Yeah. Um, so very much have lived here for most of my life. Um, and we immigrated to New Jersey, and that's where primarily I was raised until we moved to Texas. Nice. So we really represent parts of, of the diaspora, don't we? Asian Pacific mm -hmm. Islander, Taiwanese, both originating in Southern China. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, as I was saying, I, I kind of want to just launch right in, uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah? Let's do it. All right. So the first thing that really stood out to me is the title of your book which is includes the words permission and home. And I was like, okay, we're, we're on a journey here, right? We have permission and we have home. I wanted to, and literally every chapter of the book starts with the word permission. Why, why did you feel that was important? Yeah, it's funny because I knew the title of this book before I even knew its true contents. 
And that was, it was kind of an idea that stuck with me because I think as Asian Americans or even just Asian diaspora, there is because of our connections with our family, with our connections with our parents and culture, I had always felt that throughout my life, there was a permission seeking. Mm -hmm. Can I do this? Mm -hmm. Who who do I love? What career do I pick? Where do I live? There are all these kind of ways in which I oriented outward towards the people I loved to seek permission for different Mm -hmm. aspects of my Mm -hmm. life. And yet, as I kind of journeyed for myself and then with my clients, there was almost this tandem feeling that I also needed to claim permission for myself. Internally. And yes, internally. And then also in some ways externally, because, you know, I think for many of us at some point, our wants and needs diverge perhaps Mm -hmm. from those Mm -hmm. expectations. Mm -hmm. And so then starting to claim permission over spaces of our lives that maybe previously we had not questioned. And then this idea of coming home, I really, I think it resonated with me because being Taiwanese American, having been raised here, I'm not really at home in Taiwan. Uh I'm seen as too Western, Mm -hmm. too foreign. I speak with accented Mandarin, right? They can tell right away that I'm from the United States. And so while I'm there, there's not a sense of home. And even here in the United States, despite being raised here, despite being able to speak the language, being trained in education here, I very much don't necessarily feel at home either. Uh huh. And I think with the rise of COVID too, it made it very apparent that that belonging or even acceptance was very conditional. Yeah. So I think this idea of coming home then almost had to be an idea that almost we had to co-create for ourselves because perhaps home is not a place, a Mm -hmm. community, a person, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but maybe it is a condition of being that we need to move into. And so I think that's where kind of the title of the book, really the space that I tried to kind of create there. Yeah. It's, it's very powerful that kind of over and over, you know, there's this repetition of permission, permission, permission. It's such a powerful concept. It must have felt like this is really something I need people to to get. This is something I need people to feel. Yes, 100%. And I think in working with clients, and this is what I love about the work that we do, we learn so much through our clients' growth and journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I came to realize that many of my Asian American clients, they needed to move to a place where they could give themselves permission for so many aspects of their lives. Yeah. And I think that theme kept coming up again and again in all different age ranges and all different identities that I was like, there's something here. Yeah. And I I saw many in many times the transformational power once someone was able to give themselves Mm -hmm. permission, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. permission to love who they wanted to love, permission to pursue a career that they were really passionate about permission to feel their emotions. Yeah. That really started to create these shifts that I think changes people's lives. I was going to save this this comment or question for later, but it feels like a moment to ask it. Like one of the things I've noticed in my practice is that often Asian clients will come in and for a long time there won't be words there, there's a lot of emotionality. Some, there's often a lot of tearing or crying. And, you know, we, we're curious about what's happening, but there aren't words for that. Mm. I wonder, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, you know, I think it's funny because sometimes I will ask people, um, what was the word that was said to you in your mother tongue? Mm-hmm. And that almost creates a visceral effect in some of my clients. Maybe it was a harsh, critical word that a parent had said to them, or maybe it was a loving, tender word, or even their name in their native language. Mm -hmm. And I think one, one of the things I wonder about in the lack of words is that sometimes 
our, our consolidation of memories and time and experiences are intertwined with language that mm-hmm, is not mm-hmm. accessible to us in our conscious memory anymore. You know, I was raised hearing Taiwanese spoken by my grandparents and parents and then moved to the United States and then started learning English. But Mandarin and Taiwanese were my first languages. Right, right. And so I think the lack of words sometimes comes from, right, I don't know the word anymore because oh, I've lost some of that native language, huh. my mother tongue. Yeah. But I think another element when it's not related to language and all of that is we weren't always taught the words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think about how my pro- parents processed emotion. Right. It was very infrequently with words. Yes so much through emotion or silence yes yes and so i think that in so many ways I, my hope with this book was to put some words almost to create a scaffolding where people could now input their own words into their experiences absolutely and now finally be able to bring light to those experiences in a conscious sort of way because i feel like we feel them in a bodily way somatic way but i think in the therapy room it is very much word dependent or Mm -hmm. language dependent Mm -hmm. and so it takes time for Mm -hmm. people to get there Mm -hmm. that was something i so appreciated about your book is is the structure that you offered Mm -hmm. and literally calling them rest stops you know Mm -hmm. like let me let me pause here and Mm -hmm. feel what it is I'm feeling in response to the words I've been offered. Um, at first I was, I was a little taken aback and then I thought, oh no, this is actually, this makes it really accessible in all of the ways that you're, you're talking about right now where we don't have words or we, or we don't have scaffolding yep. um, for our experience. It's actually something I wanted to follow up on because one of the things that you're asking us to do in the Asian diaspora in terms of mental health is question our culture. And I actually wrote the, the question, question culture, exclamation <laughs> point. Yes. Because, right, we often feel in the Asian diaspora that culture is something that structures us and that we rely on those structures like scaffolding. I, I actually wrote that down mm-hmm. as the question. So how, how complicated it is for us? How do we go about questioning culture? And it's funny because I have friends who say, if my mom read your book, (gasps) right? Like all the things you're asking us to question, I don't know that they would approve, right? Yeah, right. And I think what I really try to do, and I don't know if I do this well in the book, but I really try to hone into this idea that I'm not asking us to, by any means, um, disparage, reduce Um, see our culture from a deficit. That Mm. is not what I'm asking us to question. Okay. Okay. I'm actually asking us to question the different elements, the frames, the lenses that our culture offers us and to kind of evaluate how well that resonates and aligns with ourselves, Mm. right? And I think uh, one easy example is, you know, Asian culture in its kind of original roots is pretty patriarchal, patriarchal, right? I always have a problem saying that word every syllable, but (laughs) you know, that, that, so that is something where, you know, I've seen the effects of it on my mother's generation, on my grandmother's generation. I've seen it manifest in my relationship with my father and what Mm -hmm. he expects from me being Mm -hmm. a daughter. Mm -hmm. And there have been times where I have felt the weight of it in a way that felt really stifling and at times limiting. And I've had to kind of think to myself, okay, this is an element that comes from some cultural roots of my heritage. Yes. But how much do I allow that to restrict or open up spaces and ideas of what's available to me? And I'm not saying that, because I think there's an element where there's that respect to even the older generation Mm -hmm. that I think is so beautiful Mm -hmm. part of Asian culture. Yes. But I also want us to say, 
to what end, how far, what feels right when we apply these cultural elements, right? Yeah. And I think about within the Asian culture, there are different frameworks about, you know, what related to anti-Blackness mm -hmm. in the Asian community, mm -hmm. how it relates to LGBTQ, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are very specific frames that would be considered consistent with the culture. Definitely. But does that resonate with who I am becoming? Oh, nice question. Yeah. And if it doesn't resonate, then how do I still honor the elements of my culture that mm -hmm. I can pull from mm -hmm. and also allow myself to release from some elements that don't feel aligned? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you're really naming a, 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 a conflict that can be generational. It mm -hmm. can be due to assimilation. Mm -hmm. It can be due to kind of the social changes, the awareness that, that we're having, the increasing awareness um, about the way that we're socially structured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I love is that it, it gives us a, an opportunity to navigate those things. They are not either or, or black and white, right? And that's wonderful. You did this, um, this piece and I'm, I'm jumping around in my own questions, but I just loved this. You ask these questions and I'm just gonna read them. What does knowing and expressing our emotions do what impact does it have? How did, oh, and this is my question to you. How did you come to those questions? How did you discover those questions in your own life or in your work with clients? I often tell my kids that I'm a professional question asker <laughs> as my day job. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I think that these often were questions that I had to ask myself. Uh-huh. You know, and, and I think we were talking about our positionality in terms of, you know, our immigration story. And I came from parents who were very much that first generation immigrants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I came from, you know, a family in which due to my astrological sign, I, my mom was pressured to give me up for adoption. And uh. people will say, what? Right. That you're not even that old. That yeah. wasn't even that long ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think I I watched, and it's interesting because now my mother has really also grown in her understanding of the frameworks that she's grown up in mm. and watching her having to navigate the in-between of raising an Asian American child while yes. living between her own parents who are still Taiwanese, They're, right. they never immigrated. And so she was that kind of link. And so I think those questions came from observing her mm. and her difficulties oh. of, with emotions, her difficulties right. with understanding and appreciating the knowledge that came from her emotional life. Huh. And then also then saying to myself, but what does that do for me if I mm. follow in that same path? Mm. At what cost? So uh -huh. I think a lot of those questions came from even my own experiences, but then I think it helped me then ask the questions to my clients because many also, I have many clients who their parents came as refugees from Vietnam, right? Yeah. I have many clients who they are maybe the second generation. And so they're also in that space. And so I think the questions, I really wanted people to really pause. And that's why we like mm -hmm. created these boxes. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't want people to live and read this book up here. I wanted them to feel it. Yeah. Inside. Yeah, yeah. You know, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, yeah, at what cost? At what cost is such an important question because I think you probably have felt this personally. You've probably seen this in your office. What, what, are, what do you think are the costs? What are, we, what are we risking? What are we giving up if we're not asking ourselves these questions? Sorry. No, all good. Um, I think there are many costs. I think that the costs fall in a few buckets, I guess. One being identity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's crucial because that informs how we see ourselves 
in the context of the world that we're in. Mm -hmm. And it also informs how we see our world, right? Yeah. I also think the cost is in what we can dream of, Mm. the opportunities we reach out for, right? Interesting. Because one of the things that I've noticed is there are a lot of my clients, especially if their parents are kind of that first generation, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear embedded in things like taking risks, Mm -hmm. you know, switching jobs when you don't have one in hand. (laughs) Yes. Right. (laughs) A lot of fear with uncertainty. Yeah. And yet I really do believe that uncertainty is the space in which innovation, creativity, exploration Mm -hmm. is also born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we are not able to tolerate those very ambiguous spaces and the discomfort that triggers in us, then we sometimes will do the safest thing, stay in a job we hate, stay in a relationship we know we're mistreated in. Yeah continue to tolerate conditions as people of color that we mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. are not equitable. Mm-hmm. And I think that might have been a strategy that was effective for our parents, because let's be honest, what they had accessible to them in terms of their rights, their yeah. access, privilege resources were much more limited. Definitely. But I think as this next generation, we also have to say, you know, The fact that I'm speaking English without an accent is already a privilege. Very much so. And that gives me access to a little bit more leverage to be a little bit perhaps more risky or to dream a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. I think really important that you're saying though, we have to build in ourselves tolerance for the discomfort that arises if we risk anything other than what's been structured or prescribed for us, right? Absolutely. And so I wanted to ask you, like, I, again, I feel like it's, it's a, a wonderful ask. It's a big ask often Huge. within our communities, right? And should people expect that that's going to be easy or that they're going to feel regulated a lot of the time? How, how bad can that feel? It can be so activating that it causes us to shut down, to be honest, right? I mean, I think about many layers, right? Because we're not just Asian American, we are women, or we are, you know, XYZ identity that is not the dominant identity. Right, right, right. So we're feeling uncomfortable, not just in our race or our ethnicity, we're feeling uncomfortable in many spaces in our lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so Absolutely not. This work, and that's why I kind of say in the book, this is why people often don't undertake the work because it creates so much emotional discomfort or upheaval yeah. in us. Yes. Yeah. And to be able to build tolerance for that, yeah, I think sometimes requires the support of a therapist or mm. a mentor or a mm. friend right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I always say we can try to bolster our ability to show up in a certain way in our lives. But if we do that without the communal support, without the psychological sensitivity, we could end up re-traumatizing ourselves, right? Yeah, yeah. And what I've noticed in the kind of in the aftermath and the continuation of the anti-Asian hate is a lot of Asian Americans are saying, I want to take up space. I want to speak my truth. I want to share my story. Right. And they'll do it in spaces that are not safe, like the workplace. Uh, uh Or they'll do it with friends who haven't done their own work in terms of understanding social and racial justice. Right, right. And guess what? Then they get the the response. And that's terrifying when you have finally worked up the courage. Yeah to say something. So I think that the discomfort is absolutely, I mean, I think if you're going to undertake this, you have to accept there will be discomfort, but I always say it's like a muscle, right? You practice it today a little bit and it gets a little bit easier tomorrow. Yeah. 
And then you wake up and you realize you've been on this journey and those muscles are stronger now <laughs> and you can carry it easier. Yeah. Yeah. Not to say that the weight necessarily lightens. Mm. Sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. But you actually find that you are much more resilient than you thought you could be. That's really helpful. You know, I, I often um, use metaphors of learning different sports because, mm -hmm. right, it's that somatic kind of experience when you're learning a new activity, a new sport, your body doesn't know how to do it. It's really uncomfortable. You're really awkward. You become very sore. Maybe you develop blisters, like all kinds of things can and do happen. Yes. And you have to practice and you have to learn and you have to develop, right, body memory and skill. And it, it may not be the most accessible metaphor, but uh, it's, just what, it's what I associated to when you were saying that. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes time. You don't become good yes. at something overnight. Yes. I, and I'm curious for you, do you ever have clients who kind of say like, well, can't you just teach me like how not to feel, <laughs> right? Like, can't you teach me how to be unfazed by the world? Yes. Because that yes. would reduce my stress. Yeah. And like... And I'm always like, huh, I could see how that would make sense as a possible solution. Yeah. But if you're going to live in the world amongst people yeah. and structures, you're going to have some type of friction at some point. And our goal is not to make you numb to it because right. that's actually dangerous. Exactly. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. I have had, I have had clients from the Asian diaspora literally come in and say, I'm having the, these feelings, this specific set of feelings. Can you make them stop? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a really, really tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say a little bit more about like how you came to decide that you wanted, not only did you want to take this journey yourself, mm -hmm. like it sounds like through observing what was happening around you and your family and your generation, but how you decided you wanted to take that further, become a psychologist, like really, you know, champion and kind of spread, spread this, this knowledge, this, these structures and like offer these words to people. Hmm. Well, I would say that when I went to college, I was supposed to become an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> now here, see, here comes the Asian background right here, right? <laughs> I'm supposed um, to be an MD, by the way. Yes. Aren't we all right? Yes, like that was yes, the first choice. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've moved on to engineer now, but yes. Um, yes. So, you know, I, I think growing up, I honestly had no idea people did this as a profession. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think when I went to college and I went to UT Austin, so it was a large public university, um, I was doing what I thought was the kind of like fast track to getting a job. That was the purpose of college. For right. Me. That's right. And then I realized the idea of sitting behind a computer and working with Excel spreadsheets and doing numbers for the rest of my life felt really draining, right. Mm. To envision that. And so what's interesting is all along, my parents knew that I was not happy and oh. they were aware. Uh -huh. And yet they always said, what do you want to do instead? And mm. I never had an answer. There was never anything that sparked my interest enough that I was going to essentially derail from my business degree. Mm -hmm. And then I finally took psych 101 out of kind of the encouragement of um, a friend, now my husband. So kind of <laughs> <laughs> And he said he was a liberal arts major and basically said, you need to take this psychology course. This professor is amazing. And it really, I mean, this class, and it was psych 101, the most mm -hmm, basic mm -hmm. psychology class that everyone falls in love with as an undergrad, right? <laughs> and it, it changed my framework of what was possible. So for the first time I was seeing psychology professors, I was seeing researchers, I was seeing people in clinical work. And so I, I literally, I was in my junior year, first semester, changed all my coursework, dropped wow. out of a five-year accounting program, changed all my coursework to basically take all my psychology prereqs in the last two years of college. Huh. Basically by that point, I was at a finance degree because I was on like a master's track. So fine, I had a degree, my parents yeah. were happy. Nice. 
but I kind of derailed and started taking all these psych courses and it was the most fun I have ever had in education. Mm. And it was almost this like fire was lit under me. And I, I shared this story in the book where when I was applying to graduate school, yeah, this, you know, professor, very well known, very famous. I'm not going to say his name, <laughs> um, but he basically said, you're not getting into PhD programs. This oh. is not happening for you. You need to get a master's. You are a non-traditional student. You come from a business background. Even though I had taken all the prerequisite courses, I essentially was at a double major in psychology. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it was him. We have him to thank. It was him who lit a fire under me and said, oh, I'm going to prove you so wrong. Hmm. And I'm only going to apply to PhD programs and I'm going to get into something. Huh. And I think there's a part of me now that says, had I been a white cisgender male student, would he have ever said that to me? And I think that was what kind of said to me, there's something here. Yeah. And in all of my undergraduate education, there was not one Asian American graduate student that I had met, assistant, adjunct, associate, or full professor who was Asian American. Yeah. And this is in Texas. We have a lot of Asians here. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I think there was something there and it was almost this like, I don't know, it lit a flame. Hmm. And then I went to graduate school. And that's a whole nother space, right? That we can talk more about. <laughs> yes. But that was kind of my journey of really finding that psychology was something that resonated with really who I was as uh -huh. a person, uh -huh. which was somebody who is oriented towards people and relationships. And I often say that as a child of immigrants, first, you know, gener you know, for 1.5 generation eldest daughter. I learned how to be a therapist, I think, in my earliest stages, simply because I was a therapist for my mom and uh -huh, my dad, uh -huh, uh -huh. right? And I think a lot of people understand those themes as well. Yeah, yeah. So you not only already sort of internally had a way of, of giving yourself permission because you could feel that this was something that lit something in you. You could experience that this was actually something that you liked as opposed to something you were doing out of obligation. That's right. There's a, a tremendous difference in those yes. feelings, which you go into in the book. You can feel when it's right and you mm -hmm. have to pay attention to that. Um, and there was both external permission, right? Your husband said, go take this class, Jenny. And you're like, okay. <laughs> but, but also your professor who tried to challenge you and say, mm, no, not you. Right. Not you, Jenny Wang. You don't have permission yet. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be like that. The, the journey is going to be like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So I wrote this section because we're on this topic. And, and literally I titled it, safe spaces, white spaces, grad school, mm. being a psychotherapist. So here's the question. Have you been able to find professional homes within our discipline? And in your acknowledgments, stay with me, in acknowledgments, you appreciate your colleagues, teachers, supervisors, mentors, and all of them have non-Asian sounding names. And then in your appreciations you you name your hype team mm. and your hype team all sounds asian to me so i thought i'm gonna ask her about that because there's something there yes you know what's funny is i think growing up in new jersey where there was not a predominant asian community it's funny i was very used to being in white spaces under the condition of assimilation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. That was what I knew. That was what I thought was required of me in those spaces. And so I know how to code switch, which many of us know. Yes. Right. right. And it became almost like a skill set that I could turn on and off when I needed to. Um, and what's interesting is that 
when I went to graduate school, we actually had, so our cohort was of eight and we had, um, I want to say we had four females at the time and four male students in our cohort. Mm -hmm. But I had a Filipino American classmate. I had an African American classmate. I had a Latinx classmate. It was one of the most diverse in several spaces, which yeah. was really unusual, honestly. Yeah. Um, Cause if you look back to earlier cohorts, they were predominantly white at the very least and mostly female, honestly, mm. at mm. the time. Um, and so I think that when I think about my um, academic settings, to be honest, most of my supervisors were white. Mm -hmm. And that was not something that I had control over perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. found that even in that, there were spaces that they offered that were safe. And I was mm -hmm. super grateful for that. Yeah. But there were also spaces that I didn't realize at the time were unsafe. And after leaving graduate school, oh. I realized they were unsafe huh. after leaving the training, because in a way I felt like I had fashioned myself to ignore the lack of safety. Oh, yes. Almost yes, as a yes. code switching yes. coping mechanism. Right. Sure. So when I talk about mentors and, you know, individuals who had helped me as supervisors or trainees and mentor or trainers and mentors, um, they did reflect a very white dominant space and that's mm -hmm. academia, right? Mm -hmm. That is yep. why academ academics can be quite harmful to mm -hmm. people of color. Mm -hmm. And then when I think about my hype team, it's interesting because each of those people, I kind of have, I'm the type of person who picks up like one or two really good friends mm -hmm. all along each stage of life. Yeah. And so some of them were from my childhood where I went to at the time a predominantly Chinese American church. And so uh -huh. there were a couple of friends that came from that, but they didn't go to my school, which was mm -hmm. still predominantly white. So it was almost like there were pockets in which there were individuals that I resonated with, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. And, and then I went to UT Austin, which has a large Asian American population. So picked up a couple more kind of friends there that, you know, were also Asian American. But I say all of this to kind of say that in many phases of my life, I would say before I turned maybe 30, 35, I almost was really good at compartmentalizing spaces. Yeah. Right? These are yeah. the places where you know, I can fully be me in my right. Asian American identity and then yes. spaces where I needed to be kind of like the more American Jenny. Right? right. Right. And I think it's only come into this decade of my life from my thirties, almost forties, where I'm now much more willing to integrate those spaces, even in my mind hmm. to draw from those spaces. Yeah. And to cultivate, like you said, those professional safe places, because yes. they don't come to you by accident. And so I've, you know, I have a consultation kind of like group that I meet with all yeah. female psychologists, uh, many of us mothers, you know, yeah. and it's been such an amazing safe space. And we come from a lot of different backgrounds. Yeah. And that was a very intentional act because I'm in private practice. So it can be so isolating, right? Yeah. In your own yeah, practice. Yeah. So I guess all this to say that, you know, I think over my life, I've had kind of these pockets and spaces. And at the time, it felt like it was normal to keep them separate. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in a place where I'm like, actually, the integration of all of them actually feels more authentic yeah. to my experience. Do you think that's developmental? Like, per, like in terms of your own personal and professional development, do you think it's, um, like I also am in a very intentionally constructed consultation group that is multiracial, mm -hmm. right? And we, we actually really like each other. So it feels yeah. very safe and we can take a lot of risks. And it is also the place that I was really able to integrate my Asian-ness, my non-whiteness and my psychologist-ness. Like yeah. th that was the safe place for it to come together and begin to spread. 
professionally. Mm -hmm. So, so yet you're not in yes, that you feel like it's developmental, that it's something we have to come to and intentionally make. I think that, yes, to answer your question, I do believe it's developmental because I do believe that ethnic or racial identity is developmental in nature as well. Okay. Right? Okay. So I think that and I think Dr. Jean Kim, you know, it, it was, was her, I think, dissertation when yeah. she first kind of put together that model. And not everybody fits and resonates with that model, but is this idea that, you know, I think had I, I always wonder this, had I grown up in a predominantly Asian enclave, maybe yeah. in California, yeah. or maybe in different parts of the coasts, right? I don't know that my evolution would have had this path at all, right. honestly. Probably not. And so I think that those developmental trajectories take on really different shapes mm -hmm, based on mm -hmm. the context and the set points mm -hmm. that you're in. Yeah. And I kind of, my, I feel like my kids are this grand experiment now, right? Because <laughs> we talk about our Asian-ness a lot uh -huh. and we talk about how important these these rituals, these ideas, our identity, we do that in such a deliberate way that my son will be like, did you notice in Star Wars or Star Trek that these people were black and these people were Asian and these people mm, were white nice. and he's six, right? Wow, so great. So I think that in that, I didn't have the language for so right. many years of my life Right. that that integration, I don't think would have happened without the growth and the learning that I needed to catch up on. Yeah. But I have friends who grew up in California and they're like, oh, I've always been extremely proud of my Asian <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I wish I had that. Yeah, right? yeah. So I think everybody's journey is different, but I think you're absolutely right. There is a journey in that mm -hmm, sphere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I just wanted to highlight maybe because, you know, we're doing this conversation at CIS and we train a lot of therapists. I wanted mm -hmm. to highlight that what, you know, what you said that you can't expect it it's not going to be there for you, that it's something that you have to make quite intentionally sometimes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to switch gears a little bit. I wanted to talk about this kind of current moment in the United States. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rather difficult moment, um, what the pandemic has exposed, mm -hmm. our politics over the last several years, many years, all the violence that's been happening in many communities. And with regard to the Asian diaspora, you write about the dangers of being silent and about invisibilization. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to talk about that because I found that very important and very powerful. And, you know, you and I were talking a little bit about silence. So what, what do you see the dangers of silence for, for our communities to be? Mm -hmm. I often kind of share with clients that Silence is the space where shame breeds. And in particular with mental health, right? And I remember stories as a child where somebody, you know, a family would have a child struggling with something. We didn't know the name of it. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what it was, but we knew it wasn't physical. Mm -hmm. And then they suddenly, this child would be sent back to Taiwan. Oh gosh. To be raised by other family members. And that was really, I don't know. It was terrifying. Scary. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so th this idea that like, my goodness, something like that would cause parents. And I'm not judging those parents by any means. Sure, sure. They did what they could or what they thought was the right thing because they didn't have resources here back right. then in the United right. States that were necessarily that helpful. But this idea that like, we're not going to talk about it. It's going to disappear. We're going to make it disappear. And that is how we handled this realm, right? Of human experience. Right. And so silence, I think when we are silent, it allows things like addiction, abuse, mm -hmm. right? Mental health struggle, um, just poor communication and skills building. Those things really then fly under the radar. They're mm -hmm. never addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think in Asian culture, and I kind of joke with my clients about this, like we kind of speak in these like low context forms of communication, mm -hmm. where it's almost like, 
I want something, but I'm not really going to tell you what I want. <laughs> I'm going to like dance around it. Right. Yeah. Whereas I think like, you know, some other cultures, it's much more direct. Like yes. these are my needs. Yeah. I'm going to tell you my needs. So they're yep. met, right. I'm, I might shout it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that adds to right. This kind of like the silencing, because yeah. then we don't speak things in a clear way. And then what the silence does is it breeds assumptions and interpretations of people and situations. Mm -hmm. And we start to feed all of these almost unchecked or unchallenged stories about our Mm. families, about ourselves, Mm. about the expectations. And so I think that mental health in the context of silence is extremely dangerous. Uh Um, and then we bring it to the greater social context, right? As Asian American, yeah. the model minority myth. Right. And the silence or the caricature of silence yes. around our people. Right. And that only fuels, right, this ability to mistreat someone because they may not speak up. They may yeah. not self-advocate. Yeah. So there's a lot there that I think we can unpack, but I think it's dangerous on an individual and yes. community level yes. and then a social level as well. Yeah, yeah. You wrote this sentence and I, I just want to read it back to you because I just love it. You say, when I name the harm that is directed at me, mm-hmm. I can shield and protect against it without allowing it to damage my sense of self. This is exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You have to name it. You have to say it, you have to speak it. Yeah. 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 That's lovely. So literally this week, this last week, we're grappling with the decisions of our Supreme Court Mm -hmm. having to do with the rights of women. We're warned that affirmative action might be next, that same sex marriage might be next. Um, These kinds of decisions that are currently affirmed through law or have historically been affirmed through law are under attack. It's a a difficult, difficult time for many of us. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this when I was reading your words on navigating systems and structures. I so appreciated this part of your book. Um, you, You write that systems and structures that attack, no, I'm sorry. I was encouraged by what you said about fighting racialized, gendered, and other forms of hate that we face in the world, Mm -hmm. and that we internalize those if we don't fight them. Mm -hmm. So how do we continue to fight hate? And you're speaking to this a little bit, but I want to say, like, what's the importance of fighting hate? We know we need to use our voice, Mm -hmm. but this is taking it even further, right? Mm -hmm. There are these, these forces in the world that that seem legitimized, that fovent hate, and we need to do something. We need to fight back externally and internally. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm processing like just everything that I think all of us are carrying. And and I'll be honest, it's been hard to work this week. Yeah. Because my clients are terrified. And, uh, and as much as I'm like, you know, you want to be a stabilizing, hopeful source for your clients. Yes. You also want to be an honest mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right, mm-hmm. source. And so I, I remember this week just being like, I wish I could say that I feel hopeful still, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. feel very discouraged too. I feel yeah. that along with you. And so I guess when I think about right this idea of fighting hate, I think it begins with me, with even myself identifying the sources of hate that mm. I unknowingly hold. Mm. Because if I can't see how I may inadvertently hold yeah. biases and assumptions, then Absolutely. how could I call out hate in someone yes. else? Right? right, right. And I think on a clinical level, but as a human being level, yeah, I think that's where I start. And that feels tangible yeah. for me. Right. right, yeah. Because if I, and of course I'm very, you know, I very much support us being mobilized in a exterior way, sure. right? I think it, is in tandem, 
But I think the hardest part is that hate is about protecting the ego, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? This is the identity that I hold. And so I don't, I can't hold space for another identity. To me, that's hate, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so if, can I work on my ego? Can I work towards understanding and humbling myself? Mm -hmm. Because I personally think humility is the way to combat hate. And so we fight hate, not because it's simply for other people, because that has almost like a saviorism aspect to it. Yeah. I combat hate because it's also for me. Right, right. To Don't purge. just call it out in the world, call it out in myself. Yes. Or yeah. do both. Yes. And to purge the insidious training that I've received my whole life. Absolutely. Yes. About who and what and how things should be, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think sometimes like, you know, I think about like cross community coalition building mm -hmm, and it's, mm -hmm. those are really tender and often complex spaces to For exist sure. in. Yes. Cause there's so much pain there. And I think I have to say like, until I've confronted my pain, mm -hmm. how can I even begin to hold space for someone else? So agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think as a community, we have to start digging at even our own racial trauma. Yes. Yes. Because if I'm slowly empowered and freed from it. Yeah. Then I can hold space for people and not say, but what about me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Right. And the whole like comparative suffering piece right. that I think gets in the way of combating hate. It's where things collapse often, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Okay. I know we're getting close to the Q and A <laughs> and I want to nerd out with you for just one minute. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, the reason I say nerd out is because I was looking at your resources and references, right? Which is what we do if we've like done research and you, in the resources, you mentioned some excellent and familiar authors, Resma mm -hmm. Menicum, Kathy Park Hong, mm -hmm. the papers by Hong and Ng. And, mm -hmm. and then in your references, there are all these articles from neuroscience. And I was like, wait, where was all of that in the book? Yes. And, you know, some of them, a lot of them were in the emotions chapter. Okay, okay. Right. Talking about how like emotions affect attention and focus and memory okay, and things okay. like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and because there weren't a ton of references, because the book is very much a narrative kind of yeah. conversational style. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't cite them specifically. Um, and that was <laughs> not, my editor decided to do that. Um, but yes, you know, I think that was where a lot of those references came from. They were really trying to make the case that your emotions affect so many facets of your yeah. perception, your memory, yeah. your attentional focus and all of that. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I wanted to ask that because I also, I think, wanted to emphasize that, right? This isn't, mm -hmm. this isn't an intellectual exercise. This isn't mm -hmm. something we're just talking about. This is something yeah. that affects all parts of us and affects them deeply. Yes. And then, of course, affects all of our relationships. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 Thank you for explaining that. I was, I was taken aback for a moment about your yeah. references. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that we should get into any more of my big questions. I was wondering if there was some, anything that got stirred for you in our conversation that you mm. wanted to come back to or wanted to bring up or an association or memory that you had that yeah. felt relevant. Um, yeah, you know, I, I feel like our conversation has almost like slowly washed over me as we're hmm. talking, hmm. you know, and I feel like you hold space so tenderly. It's, it's clearly you are a clinician, um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I think what really struck me was how you've mentioned being, you know, fourth generation immigrant, Yeah. but these themes seem to still... You could see them, right? Absolutely. You could feel them. Yes. 
And so I, I, I kind of have a question for you. Like, sure. what was that like, you know, reading a book from my vantage point of being closer to that immigration and migration yeah. story, Yeah. but then seeing this and, and how much resonant did, resonance did it offer you? Well, my partner and I have a joke because I always thought 100% meant everything. Um, <laughs> But I found out that there's something called 1000%. <laughs> Stunningly, this is a question I, I often have for myself, you know, being, being in, well, not exactly a, a U.S. citizen for all those generations, but being born outside of China, mm -hmm. um, how much would it resonate for me? Yeah. And I have to tell you completely, mm. absolutely 100%, 1000%, 1, it yeah. resonated for me. My journey has been very similar to yours mm. um, in the sense of needing to discover the freedom within myself, the tolerance mm. within myself, you know, the capacities within myself to be able to make choices that respected and relied on my culture, mm. but also forefronted my feelings, my thoughts, my needs, and who I wanted to be in the world. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, mm. it resonated completely. Yeah, mm. I'm glad you asked. Yeah, I'm always curious, right? Because I, I think I put in the introduction, like this is written from my singular observation, right? Of my life and my clinical work. Yeah. And so there are so many stories and I hope there are so many more books to come about yeah. those differences and nuances. So I think in writing the book, there was almost a fear in me, like what if it doesn't really resonate beyond like my generation, right? Mm. Of being 1.5 generation, you know? What if it doesn't yeah. resonate across many, you know, yeah. like many uh, evolutions? Yeah. Um, so it's really neat to hear that the themes did strike. Yeah, I don't think you need to be concerned about that. You know, I'm, I'm curious because I know you're active uh, on social media or mm. in the social, I see, I'm very old. So I'm going to call it, you know, <laughs> no. like online. You're very, very active wise. online. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm wondering if you're finding that resonance, you know, in, in a, in a really widespread way among the diaspora, like, you know, you and I are both predominantly Chinese in origin, but like mm -hmm. among other Asian groups, for, for instance. Yeah. I think of the feedback that I've received, it's, it's, people have shared that it's cross ethnic lines, right? Mm -hmm. So Japanese American, Korean American, Vietnamese American, um, it seems to have resonances there. And then also people outside of United States have said, I bought your book in Australia and oh, I've wow. grown up there. I bought your book and I'm from the UK or I'm from the Netherlands. Yeah. And so I think that there's something about, right, this idea of migration and displacement mm. that I think the stories and the ideas do resonate and they manifest yeah. in the ways that I think, you know, it's almost like the context is different, but perhaps the themes are similar. Mm. Um, so that's been really neat to see, you know, yeah. people who didn't grow up in the United States. And so sometimes some of the historical kind of like things, perhaps they, they're not as like direct, but they still say, you know, these are similar ideas and frames in which I've had to question myself. Well, that must be wonderful for you to know how deeply it's resonating yeah. in many, many places and across generations. For sure. It's, I feel like that's the gift that people are now offering me is like being able to say like, in many ways, this book is how I'm being seen as well, right? Mm. It's like, I see my community and in turn, they're seeing me. And I think it's such a like bi-directional gift in many That's ways. That's wonderful, yeah. Okay, maybe last question, because we don't, we're running <laughs> out of time. But um, you offer so many practical applications and exercises and ways that people can do their work while they're reading your book. Um, I wonder if you have suggestions, like someone has read the book and they're like, okay, Dr. Jenny Wang, this has been great. I wanna do more. I wanna mm -hmm. go deeper. I wanna expand on what, what I've discovered. What, what suggestions would you have? Yeah, I would say start with people in your life who you could dialogue with. You know, people have started book clubs. My favorite part is when parents have, or people have brought their parents to my book oh, signing. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that feels so like, <laughs> warm and fuzzy, right? Yeah. Um, and I think people have said, like, I'm reading it with my parents. I'm reading oh. it with my siblings. Yeah. Um, and 
I think that, you know, what's really powerful is that our stories as a family constellation, we only see it from our vantage point. Right. So when we go back and talk about it with our siblings and our parents and all these other kind of people, it helps create a more fuller picture of that mm. experience. Yeah. And so I think my hope is that, you know, people will pick up this book at different seasons of life and maybe look up certain chapters and kind of meditate on those ideas or, and, and kind of go back and, you know, it's, it's almost like hopefully a reference as well as like a read through kind of experience. Mm -hmm. But I think with the rest stops, with all the exercises, mm -hmm. I wanted really people to not read it yeah, and then be like, okay, I know the content. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But like yeah. to really almost like metabolize it, chew mm -hmm. through it, mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. it even, even mm -hmm. say, does this theme really make sense to me? And if not, you know, what else does? How yeah. else could I frame it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the hope. It's almost that people will like highlight it and cross out and strike mm -hmm. through and mark through it. Like just mm -hmm. really kind of like chew into it almost yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you imagined this when you wrote it, but I can imagine going back to some of the, you know, the inquiries, the rest stops, the exercises mm -hmm. repeatedly over and over, you know, again, to kind of exercise those muscles to really, you know, use them as, as, as meditations or exercises mm -hmm. into the future. I think they'd be incredibly helpful. Yeah. I, I'm feeling like maybe we should turn to some of the audience questions. Are you ready for that? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Uh, here is a question from an anonymous attendee. Where do you find the courage to live authentically? Mm. Oof. Question like gave me chills. Yeah, it's a big one. I think sometimes I start with identifying where I'm not living authentically. And what is keeping me from that? You know, what are the barriers? What are the stories? What are the people, the spaces, you know? And I, I think the courage, honestly, it's not like I have courage and then I go forth. It doesn't work that way for me at least. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. the, I try and I stumble and I say the wrong awkward thing and I mess up and yet I keep trying and then I look back and I realize I had been courageous all along. Mm. Hmm. And I, I am a huge believer that action gives us data mm. and data helps us, right? Tweak, shift, pivot, adjust. Hmm. And so I think I try to live courageously even in the smallest things like when I walk in an elevator, do I meet someone's gaze? Mm. Do I feel like I have the worthiness to hold my head high mm. and not shrink myself? Yeah. To me, that's courage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I think that we can practice that in almost the smallest imperceptible ways. Yes. But that now gives me feedback to my brain that says, that wasn't as bad as I thought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It wasn't as scary. Mm -hmm. And then I feel a little bit more courageous to do it again. Mm -hmm. And now perhaps I'm catching the full gaze of someone in power mm -hmm. and someone who is over me. Mm -hmm. And it does not instill as much terror as it used to. Mm -hmm. And I realized that a capacity is now growing without yeah. realizing it. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about how, right? Like I, I, have, a, I have a client who, when we started, was very, very interested in doing um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Like wanted to change the work they were doing and leap into that because of what they were reading and studying. Mm -hmm. And over the course of time, what we've discovered is that it may not be, might not, may not match their skill set, mm. but what they, what the way that they can do that work is in this everyday kind of way, the way you're talking about, in what Absolutely. they choose to say, how they choose to move through the world, 
the way they choose to navigate relationships. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And even how we create space for mm -hmm. others, mm -hmm. right? It's not this like almost like imperialistic, colonialistic idea. I'm taking up space for me. Right. Right. How do I actually abdicate space and create space for others? Yeah. And that that in itself is powerful DEI work, right? Mm -hmm, in itself, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree with you 100% that that is, that is part of it every day. It makes me think about what you were saying about humility. It takes uh, a kind of courageousness, mm -hmm. right? To act with humility. Yes. And make space for others. Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So this is a, this is a, a related question from another anonymous attendee. Oh no, sorry, this one is from Jamie. Okay. Wait, now I'm getting confused. Ah, th we'll get to Jamie. This one is from an someone anonymous. I struggle with drawing boundaries because I'm used to being integrated into my family. We are very close knit. Mm. How much should I try to quote, change my parents and their viewpoints? <laughs> have you tried to change your parents viewpoints before <laughs> i try all the time it doesn't go that well um yes so i feel like this is this is part of the constant struggle right yes. of of closeness togetherness and freedom and separateness yeah right? yeah and I think our culture, one of the beauties is our closeness, right? Mm -hmm. Is our integration with each other. And how do I still exist as me in right. the context of that yes. integration? And I, I kind of feel like, you know, I know I, I now having kind of been, I guess, halfway through my journey through life, you know, I don't really try to change my parents. Mm. I might encourage, I might suggest, I might love differently, right? <laughs> but I don't know that changing is realistic or feasible mm, or mm. even my responsibility. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah. But I do believe that when people are in relation to each other, when one changes it invites the other possibly to shift yeah but i have to let go of the expectation that that shift in them will be what i want yeah yeah right? so i talk about you know when for example like setting boundaries with my own parents that's right. a learning in itself yeah and I, I love our closeness. I love how our family is very, you know, close knit as this person says, and yet they still do things that cross my boundaries and activate me on a level that is very difficult to tolerate. Yes. And so I have a choice, right? When they cross my boundaries, I can be reactive and angry. That's I've done that before. Mm -hmm. Or I can also say, hmm, are they aware of the boundary? Have I communicated it? Are they capable of adhering to the boundary? Mm -hmm. Or do I need to enact the boundary mm -hmm. through other means like physical distance, uh, time limits, right? Yeah. Creating structure around that relationship mm -hmm. because even if we communicate the boundary, right? We enforce it through our behavior, right. Right? right? And so I think that one of the things that we have to learn with our families is we kind of have to almost test what can they tolerate? Mm -hmm. What can they accept? Mm -hmm. What is within their ability to offer us and what is not? Mm -hmm. We have to see that clearly in yeah. order to know how to navigate. Such a good point, yeah. And then we, we try, right? And, and sometimes we fail and it doesn't work well. And then we try different things. Yeah. But I think even just the idea that you can have boundaries, mm -hmm. that you have permission to have that space, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that is also a first step. Yeah. yeah. And especially if we've been socialized in families where we've either explicitly or implicitly been told you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it reminds me of, of something you wrote early on in the book. You said, 
um, we're not responsible for the emotions of, of others. Mm. And I thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> but, but we were raised to feel responsible yes. for the emotions of others. Yes, yes, yes. And my clients, same reaction. They're yeah. like, no, I don't believe you, right? right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a hard framework because in many ways, I kind of, I'm like, I feel like in some ways I've been an emotional Sherpa for my family in many ways. Right. right? Yes. <laughs> like, you yes. Know, like, oh, you're upset. Let me, let me take that on. Yeah. And then you're mad. Let me take that on. Right. Yeah. And, and that is a way to live, mm -hmm. but is it a sustainable way to live? Yeah. Is it an empowered way to live? Yeah. And I always say that when we over shoulder or lean in too much, mm -hmm. it actually allows people to relinquish ownership. Yes. Yes. And so in acting as the emotional Sherpa, not only do I hurt myself, but I keep those people from learning how to own their own emotions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and learn the skill of mm -hmm. regulating it mm -hmm. and learning from it. Mm -hmm. I feel like you're saying, even if it feels really bad to take some space or create a boundary, you might be teaching your parents something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, it's always like, you know, if you've played the therapist between your parents, your, their whole lives, right. Yeah. Cause that sometimes yeah. that happens. Yeah. When have they ever learned how to be their own support, sure. Sure. their own, right. Emotional, relational kind of like, um, partner. Yeah. They don't need to, they're not yeah. incentivized to. That's right. Cause you've always offered yourself as the conduit. Yeah. It's just, I'm just reminded of what difficult work this is as you're, as you're speaking it out. Yeah. Okay. Let's get to Jamie now. Okay. Most of us wear the mask of silence all our lives. How do we share with others how to unmask, how to unmask it safely so that we can be brave enough even though our voice is shaking. Hmm. I feel like that's poetry, mm. that question. <laughs> um, hmm. I think that the mask has protected us in some ways. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always say that like any coping strategy, be it healthy, unhealthy, dysfunctional, functional, it serves a purpose. And if it didn't have a function, it would have fallen away. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So on the one hand, I, we're not necessarily saying that that mask is let's tear it off. Let's expose right. you because that's dangerous. Yeah. Right. It's, it's yeah. kind of like when we do trauma work and we're like, people are like, let's go all in. And you're like, that is not safe. Yeah. Right? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the mask of silence, right. On the one hand was semi-protective, but on the other hand was about reputation and facade and hmm. saving face, right? mm. which is a common theme in our yes. culture. Yes. And so I think unmasking it, we do it almost in layers, right? In, in, in this outer shell with safe people and then the next layer. And just like communication, just like tolerance of discomfort, vulnerability mm -hmm. is a skill that can mm -hmm. be developed and strengthened. Yes, yes. And I think one of the things that I always say in my book events, I always somehow end up crying some way or other, right? Oh, we got to get you there. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't, I don't enjoy crying in front of people. Yeah. But I think that actually is a way in which I unmask because mm -hmm. my whole like professional life, right? It's been like, but you're a psychologist, you're not supposed to cry. You're not supposed to show emotion. You're supposed <laughs> mm. to be the blank slate. Mm. And that to me has always felt like a very power differential mm. relationship. Now yeah. I'm not saying I cry with clients. I don't cry with clients, but it is in the facade of how I present myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And somehow that keeps me safe and professional. Right. But I think our community needs 
we don't need more competence. We don't need more excellence or professionalism. Yeah. We need more raw human Mm. vulnerability. Mm. And so unmasking it, I think, is in layers. And unmasking it, I think, is you trusting that your worth is strong enough Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. withstand the shame that Mm. feels like will come when we unmask. But I'll tell you something that's really amazing. Mm. Often that shame never comes. Mm. I love that. And we realize people say thank you because I felt the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of vulnerability and unmasking is that you have given others that gift to now do it for themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's so thematic. You just have me thinking again, like, you know, if we imagine having a mask on and you take it off, you just take it off then you feel the air and you feel the, the heat or the cold and you feel the light, you know, that it's gonna be a kind of a sudden blast of something. And what you're saying is, you know, little by little, like in ways, in ways that feel comfortable, safe, take, take risk, but don't harm yourself, right? It's too much. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This next question feels really related. Mm-hmm. Do you have advice on how to talk to your partner when they're when you are both Asian American and don't have as much vocabulary to describe conflict and emotions? Mm, mm, conflict. We love conflict. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Anger we have access to. Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, whenever I think about like partners, and especially if, you know, they come from Asian backgrounds, I think one of the first things we can try to do is actually start to reframe our narratives around conflict, right? Conflict is bad. Conflict should be avoided. Right. And can we see conflict as opportunity? I know that's really hard and most people push back on that idea, but I always say that whenever a couple comes to me and I don't do couples work, but if the individual that I'm working with says, Oh, we never have conflict. We always get along. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I get a red flag in my clinical mind, right? Because when there's no conflict, to me, it seems like one person is subsumed under the other, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So they move fluidly. Mm. But that means that one person or the other might actually be simply complying with the Mm -hmm. other to avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. So I always say our goal in relationships is not to avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. It's to learn how to find our way back to each other once conflict has occurred. Yeah. And so can we actually say when we have conflict, we learn more about each other. Mm -hmm. We learn how to love each other more effectively. Mm -hmm. And actually we just need to learn how to have conflict that's effective, right? So I say like no throwing punches below the belt, right? Because when you fight dirty, you actually don't achieve much. Yeah. Yeah. But if you can fight well Mm -hmm. and you develop that skill early on in your relationship, Mm -hmm. that really fortifies your ability to come back. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I often have thought about this over the, over the course of my career. As you were saying, there's there's so much richness in the closeness and the, and the kind of collectivist communal feeling of family that you get within Asian communities. And at the same time, we do ourselves the disservice of if there's conflict, if there's you know negative emotion, if you feel someone has turned away from you, it can feel catastrophic. Yes. It can feel disconnecting, you know, mm. but I, I feel like you're also saying, but, but it isn't like mm. just because there's conflict, it doesn't have to be catastrophic. Right. And I think, you know, I think one feature of some Asian cultures is stoicism, mm-hmm. but that stoicism also kind of says, oh, there's conflict. I'm going to shut down. Right. And for some of our 
parents, that was a trauma response, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then whenever we felt like there's potential for conflict, we didn't Ex want to have exactly. a shut down parent right? exactly. or a shut down partner. Yeah. And so we said, oh no, I don't want to go there because going towards conflict means disconnection. Yes. And how do we, as we're learning in our own relationships now, how do we say actually we can move out of disconnection and move back into connection and that sometimes conflict is the path through yes this. yes right and i think it's almost and this is why i think couples work is really important or just mm -hmm. having somebody kind of help offer the language and those skills because mm -hmm. if our framework is conflict is bad we will never be able to be sold on the idea that conflict is actually good yeah yeah <laughs> so. yeah Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to read this last question that, that I, that I can see. Um, what are your thoughts on the wide array of differences in Asian American communities and how to address mental health and mental health care for those specific experiences, cultures, and communities? Mm -hmm. mm, yes. So this is why I think it's so important that we raise up another generation of providers and, you know, therapists and mental health folks within our community. Um, because right now, I mean, we're, we're simply just saying, Hey, Asian mental health matters. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> That's Love where it. we're at. Right. Yes. But I hope that as more people enter our field from all different Asian American communities, now we can actually say, okay, now there's nuance. Mm -hmm. Now there's layers that are unique to people who grew up in Cambodia mm -hmm. during a certain decade of time. Mm -hmm. There are nuances for people who lived in, I don't know, Laos, right? Mm -hmm. And those, and the thing is, right? Lived experiences inform our clinical work right now mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. The research is not there yet. Right, 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 right. And so I think that what we do need to do, and I wish I had the, the courage to do this in earlier parts of my training was to say, my Asian-ness is part of the evolution of the field for mental health in our community. Mm -hmm. And how do I bring my intimate experiences and knowledge and the stories, the oral histories of my people into the clinical work that I do? Because that is how we hone our clinical work. Yeah. And if I don't know that experience, right? If I'm working with somebody of a different ethnic background, can I allow myself to learn and hold space and appreciate the importance of that story mm -hmm. in how that creates and shapes this person's mental health and identity. Yeah. And so I think right now we're working with big brush strokes. Right. And one day I hope it is like a multicolored, right? Like yeah. array. Yeah. And we can much more kind of in granular view help our unique communities because mm -hmm. you're right we're not a monolith so right right yeah well dr jenny way it looks like we're at about that time and i just want to appreciate you so much for sitting down to write this book for mm -hmm. taking the risks in your to tell your own personal journey and include so much of yourself in the narrative um, you know, as a, as a fellow Asian American, it's a, it's a very risky thing to do, but it, it models, as we were talking about, it models the work that you're asking us to do, mm -hmm. to have done that and offer it for, for us, as long as the exercises that you lead us through. And it's been such a delight to get to know you a little bit and speak with you. Um, is there any, anything you'd like to say in closing? First of all, thank you for having this conversation with me. Like I, I really just felt such tender and gentle guiding through this whole conversation. So I'm so grateful for being able to share kind of this time with you. Um, and I want to say to our community, I am so proud of us. I am just like, I get emotional thinking about 
what it took for each of us to get to this point today. Yeah. And I'm just so proud of where we've come from and where we're going. And I cannot wait to see what our community is going to do going forward. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. And now I'd like to bring back Alex. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded, so if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this same link and later on our Facebook page. We're also going to feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thank you again for joining us and have a great night. Mm -hmm.